Good day. I'm Professor Charlie Rose, and this is Practice Ready Evidence. And in this block of instruction today, we're going to take evidentiary law, and we're going to look at it, and we're going to look at it in the, with, within the context of depositions of expert witnesses. We're going to address the way evidentiary law connects to the federal rules of civil procedure when we are working with expert witnesses so that we can properly prepare to depose them during the pretrial process and, and then properly present them at trial. Uh, so I've titled this particular block of, uh, of instruction, Expert Witnesses and 30B6 Witnesses. And, and my goal is to, uh, is to help you to understand the way the law works and then from the law pull ourselves back to the actual advocacy of presenting uh, the evidence. Uh, let's give it a shot and see what we can uh, get done today. I'm going to go over the federal rules of evidence, kind of a once around the world. We'll look at 701, 702, 703, and a little bit of 704, and how they impact on the identification and presentation of expert witnesses. We'll look at the reliability analysis, which is actually the core function under the federal rules of evidence, under the Supreme Court jurisprudence. What we're really concerned with when dealing with expert witnesses is are we going to be able to rely upon the information that they give? And the reason that that's so important is because the expert witness has phenomenal power within the courtroom. They're fundamentally different from lay witnesses in the types of opinions that they can give uh, and their imprimatur of authority. And any of you who've been in civil courtrooms around the nation or in criminal courtrooms where expert witnesses were used probably realize that to a great extent, um, Litigation has quite often become a battle of the experts. Now, I'll leave to another day whether or not that really makes any sense from a persuasion perspective, but it is the reality. Uh, money drives that reality, and we're seeing it all the time. So the reliability of the expert is the key analytical point from Daubert and Kumho Tyre, which are the two Supreme Court cases that really deal with it. And we'll touch on that today so that you understand it. Then I want to talk about the care and feeding of expert witnesses. They're just a little different, and you have to be careful in both your interaction with them and your presentation of them. And then I want to talk to you about um, 30B6 witnesses and how 30B6 witnesses work. Um, and 30B6 witnesses, for those of you who don't know, that's the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And it's a particular type of witness that is uh, empowered to speak on behalf of the entire corporation or entity and to bind the entity for purposes of that litigation through their testimony. And it's something that, um, that everyone who's involved in complex litigation uh, needs to be aware of. So let's, uh, let's, let's get started a little bit, and, and we'll begin by thinking about how the federal rules of evidence work when it comes to um, the presentation of evidence by experts. And the first thing that you need to always remember is that the judge decides the admissibility of the expert testimony. And that's a power that the judge has under Federal Rule of Evidence 104. It resides with the judge. The Dalbert case um, often describes the judge as the gatekeeper of information. They decide whether the gate opens and the testimony comes in or the gate stays closed uh, and the testimony stays out. So that admissibility determination resides with the judge under the federal rules. Uh, and because expert witnesses have so much power, the way that we feel comfortable about the judge letting the testimony in is that we have a checklist of things that must occur first. And the first one is that there's a qualification on the part of the witness. There's a process where the advocate brings forward the qualifications of the witness based upon the rules to show that they have the requisite experience or education, usually a combination of both to qualify them as an expert witness. And qualification deals with not only the expertise of the expert, but the application of that expertise to a particular situation. There has to be a match between the two. Uh, and then that expert testimony that, that we're trying to offer is the type of expert testimony that makes certain that uh, the fact finder is assisted by it. Uh, and, and so we're looking for those things that are more likely to uh, be complex, not immediately understandable, 
where the, uh, the use of the expert witness to interpret the information uh, so that the jury can properly understand it would be helpful. We often think about in the civil arena economic an analysis, uh, statistical projections, uh, forensic accounting are, are some classic examples. Uh, the way in which, um, so for example, you might have an expert that would come in and talk about communication nodes within a corporation. Uh, the way the data is transferred, the way the data is stored, all of these are the sorts of things that the lay person, while they might be able to understand it, um, would find the testimony of an expert uh, helpful in, in dealing with it. So that's an example of that. Uh, and then the opinion's got to be properly based. I and mean, what do we really mean by that? We mean that the opinion of the expert can't just spring forth from the expert's head like Athena from the brow of Zeus. It's got to be an opinion that has a basis uh, in the hypothetical facts applicable to the case or the actual facts applicable to the case. There has to be a connection between the opinion and the issue. And if there's not a basis, uh, we're not going to let that sort of testimony in because it's just not going to be helpful to the trier of the fact. And then, of course, the methods and conclusions utilized by the expert uh, based upon their qualifications based on the issue at hand, must be reliable. Uh, the court has to feel comfortable that the expert's answer is right. And the way in which we deal with reliability is a, is a combination of factors that are not exhaustive. They come out of the Dalbert case file. They also come out of the commentary to the Federal Rules of Evidence. And, and just to give you a preview, is it subject to peer review? Has it been accepted uh, by the community within which the expert uh, is acknowledged as an expert. Is there an error rate that can be recreated if we were to test it again? And then is it testable? Is it something that we can recreate if another expert looks at it? All of those things can be helpful to us in, uh, in working through 702, 703, and 704 to determine admissibility of expert testimony. And then at the, at the end of the day, it also has to satisfy Federal Rule of Evidence 403. And by that I mean it has to be the type of information uh, where the probative value is not substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice, confusion of the issues, waste of time, or misleading of the jury. That's the standard 403 balancing test. The admissibility of expert witnesses is in fact tied to the standard 403 balancing test, and that's the sort of the catch-all provision in evidentiary law that we always fall back on. Uh, new advocates and new lawyers often make the mistake of beginning with the 403 analysis when they should actually end with it after they've addressed the other evidentiary issues. So that sort of gives you an idea of what we're thinking about from the standpoint of the broad overview of the things that I want to accomplish with you today. But, but as we think about expert witnesses, um, the first thing that we're really looking at uh, when we go to present an expert witness, deals with the nature of the expert. And by the nature of the expert, what I'm talking about is the qualifications. What makes them the type of witness that should have this phenomenal cosmic power of an expert? How do we um, consider them uh, to be special? Because that's really what it's about. There's a specialness to the expert witness that is unique to that witness and that we want to make certain uh, is attributable to them uh, in a way that we can properly characterize. So we look to the thing that's often referred to under Federal Rule of Evidence 702 as the qualifications of the witness. The qualifications, and, and, and the Federal Rule of Evidence 702, well, we can break it down here into a slide, and the slide will give us an idea of, um, hang on just a second here. The slide will give us an idea of what we're really worried about and concerned with. So, and I pulled these right out of the rule. When I am qualifying someone uh, to form an expert opinion under Federal Rule of Evidence 702, I have to show the court that they have the requisite knowledge, skills, experience, training, or education, some combination of those factors, to lay the foundation to get them qualified as an expert witness at trial. And these qualifications um, of the expert are unique to the expert, the industry, or the, um, 
to think of the right way to say this, the industry or the environment, the community uh, within which the expert resides. So for example, uh, if I'm trying to get someone to testify about an issue specific to the military, someone who served 20 years might be quite helpful in that regard. Uh, if on the other hand I want someone to talk about the way in which tires are produced in a rubber factory, it may very well be the person who has worked multiple positions on the assembly line for the creation of those tires would be easily qualified as an expert. Uh, if you wanted to uh, qualify someone uh, in the intricacies of the management of the creation of uh, a blog to maximize uh, exposure on the World Wide Web, I mean, you could get a technical engineer to talk about that, or you could get the lady who created the website Cake Pops and bring her in and talk about how she, using uh, trial and error and experience, developed this expertise as a master blogger. Uh, the thing to take away from it from a qualifications perspective is that qualification is connected to the source of the knowledge and ability that fundamentally makes the expert different. It's the thing that sets them apart. The education that they've acquired or the experience that they have uh, earned that makes them useful. And then the final thing I want you to think about when I think about qualification to form an opinion that is literally the first step in the admissibility of an expert's opinion. It's not the end point, it's not the only point, it's the sine qua non, the first thing that we must do before we can go forward. Uh, and it, it, it just sets the stage for what happens next. Because not only must I meet the qualifications under 702, I've also got to establish that the testimony is going to assist the trier of fact. And how do I work out assist the trier of fact? Well, the thing that the court has looked to in previous cases is it looks at the relevancy of the expert testimony to the issues and controversy in the case. And then it looks for counterintuitive subjects that, um, that we might often get wrong, that, that our own personal biases and uh, the way in which the human mind works would push us in the wrong direction uh, as opposed to the right direction. Uh, the classic ex example from my own personal experience many years ago, I tried a lot of sexual assault cases uh, in the military as both a prosecutor and later as a criminal defense lawyer. And one of the things that you deal with in sexual assault cases are the actions of the victim or the alleged victim after the assault has occurred, right? Uh, a rational person who has not experienced the, the trauma of being sexually assaulted would think, well, if you're sexually assaulted, you report it, you talk to the cops, you preserve all the evidence, uh, you, you report sooner as opposed to later, uh, because that will help catch the person who did this. Uh, when in actuality, uh, quite often, uh, victims, particularly young victims, don't do that. They accommodate. They continue to have relationships with the abuser. They engage in a pattern of activity that is counterintuitive, that does not make sense to the rest of the world based upon the way the rest of the world sees or perceives um, how the world should function, not how the world actually functions, but the way that their own bias tells them that it should function. So what do you do uh, in, a, in a case like that? You bring in uh, an expert in psychology who can talk about uh, sexual abuse accommodation syndrome, syndrome or post-traumatic stress disorder, who can translate what counterintuitively seems to be evidence of a lack of uh, activity to show how it is actually consistent with, if not predictive of, that's the abuse that was alleged. That's a classic example of the use of an expert opinion to assist the jury in understanding. Another one uh, uh, from the criminal justice arena would be um, uh, battered wife syndrome. Battered spouse syndrome, I think, is probably the more politically correct term now. Um, it's where someone who is abused stays with the abuser and actually makes excuses for the abused until that point at which they break uh, and then they do bad things to bad people. 
Uh, in Alabama, where I grew up, we used to call that the uh, they needed killing defense. Of course, uh, I don't think that's politically correct anymore either. But it's got to assist uh, the finder of fact in, in doing what needs to be done. I've got another slide here. Let's take a look at it. Uh, it gives you a list of the things that we're concerned with here, right? Relevancy, the complexity of the subject, the counterintuitive nature of the subject. Uh, this is an interesting uh, analysis, and, and as, a, as the advocate, as the lawyer, you have free reign here to go as far as is necessary to show the judge why this particular opinion will work. And sometimes that may even require uh, some degree of presentation from the expert when it's a new expert, a novel expert uh, that hasn't been used before. We had an issue, uh, we had a case here in Florida in the last few years uh, where they tried um, Miss Anthony for the alleged uh, murder of her daughter. And one of the issues in question was the decomposition of bodies in the heat and what degree of gases they might give off. And the state tried to bring in an expert who had done this sort of work with decomposing bodies in Tennessee. Well, the problem was the expert was perfect to, uh, to probably meet the standards that I'm talking about with you today under the Federal Rules of Evidence, but it did not quite deal with the Florida rules for expert witnesses as they existed at that time, and it was not admissible. Uh, and that's just a classic example of a counterintuitive subject that did not get uh, through the gate uh, for admissibility. And now one of the things that we have to do when we look at whether or not the testimony is going to assist the finder of fact uh, is, is we have to look at Federal Rule of Evidence 704. And what 704 does is, is sort of identify the boundaries of how far an expert opinion can go from an assistance perspective. And the first thing that I want to point out to you that you should remember that's a fundamental concept is that testimony on the ultimate issue in the case is not per se uh, inadmissible. So testimony on, did that gun fire uh, the bullet that killed the individual? Was the person choked to death? Were the funds withdrawn from this particular IP address? Those are all, those, those might be the ultimate issues at trial, but they are going to not be uh, excluded just because they are. We have to turn to the ability of assistance to the finder of fact. Now, there is something that the courts have told us is not helpful, does not assist, even though prosecutors the world over and sometimes plaintiff's lawyers think that it might, and that is, of course, a credibility opinion, where we want to use an expert as the equivalent of a human lie detector. We don't let uh, machines testify as to truth, and we don't let people give expert opinions as to truth. So no matter how much you like to show uh, lie to me with a micro reading of facial expressions to determine truth or, or, or lying, we don't let credibility opinions in at trial. So you can't say, I think that witness is lying, I think they did it, I think they didn't do it, their behavior is consistent with someone who's being untruthful. All that stuff is out the window uh, because it does not help. It is the the duty of the fact finder to determine credibility of the witnesses, not experts. And you need to remember that uh, when it comes to uh, the admissibility of the opinion under 704. The other thing that we have to be concerned with is the basis of the opinion, the foundation of the opinion under, under 703. <clears throat> this is where the qualifications of the expert are applied to the facts of the particular case. And 703 tells us that an expert can testify at trial based upon the facts in the case that come to them as a hypothetical question, that they have personally observed, or that were reported from third parties. Now, reported from third parties is kind of an interesting piece to that puzzle because what that means is an expert can rely upon otherwise inadmissible hearsay as the fundamental basis for their opinion. Now, prior to the change to the Federal Rules of Evidence in around 2000, this was used to smuggle in a boatload 
of hearsay evidence that was otherwise not going to be admissible through the gate of the expert witness. Supreme Court took care of that when they uh, reworked uh, this rule in, a, in around 2000. And now that basis is not going to be admissible during direct examination. But if you attack the basis of the opinion of the expert as it connects to the facts on cross-examination, you then open the door, potentially, to the admissibility of the hearsay evidence on redirect in order to explain the validity of the expert's opinion. And if you study character evidence and you know how character evidence works with reputation and opinion under the federal rules and the ability to explain the basis for the opinion with specific acts af afterwards, you see that sort of logical connection between the way the Supreme Court has dealt with character evidence and the way it's dealt with the basis of an expert witness's testimony. I mean, the thing that we're always concerned with, quite frankly, is are they the type of facts that other experts would normally rely upon, and are we preventing smuggling from occurring? And if we can say that those things are there, we're going to be okay. So we've looked at uh, the qualifications of the expert, uh, its ability to assist the finder of fact, and the basis of the opinion, its connection to uh, the issue and controversy in the case. So the, the last thing that we're left with from the standpoint of, of working out whether or not the judge should open the gate and let the expert testimony in is the reliability of the expert's opinion. You know, because it has so much potential power at trial, because it can speak as to the ultimate issue in the case, we're always concerned about whether or not um, it's sufficiently reliable that we should let it in. Because it can be case dispositive. And what the Supreme Court has done is they have defined reliability in a series of cases. Uh, Dalbert, uh, Kumho Tire, and Joyner v. Electric. And the Dalbert factors are the factors that are most important. And I always use this an acronym to remember them. Uh, I just think of Pete. Uh, has their work been the type of work that's been subject to, to review by their peers? In other words, have they published uh, their opinion? Have they published their methodology? Do other individuals rely upon it? Do other individuals within their group agree with this sort of approach from a peer review perspective? Uh, can you establish an error rate for their testing? And is that error rate subject uh, to reproduction? If I were to do it myself, could I test it and get the same result again? The classic example that I think about that is the, the gas chromatic testing for uh, the presence of drugs uh, in urine or the bloodstream. That is clearly has an error rate for the machine, and it is clearly testable and reproducible with another machine. The same thing for a breathalyzer test. Those are two classic examples. Uh, of error rate. Now acceptance is the Supreme Court's nod to the old standard before uh, the federal rules. That was the Fry standard. And that's just, yeah, you know, do most scientists, do most experts in your field agree with you that this is the right way to go about this? Acceptance can be dangerous because, it, you know, at one time it was generally accepted as a scientific uh, fact that the sun revolved around the earth. It was also generally accepted that the earth was flat. And we kind of know that both those things aren't true now. So acceptance can send us down the wrong path, uh, but when acceptance is tempered by these other factors, it's okay to use it as well. Uh, and then finally, testability. Can I recreate it if I, uh, if I go to do your test myself? These are literally the reliability factors that are necessary. So I've kind of addressed uh, these issues with you from an evidentiary perspective. The last thing then in this block of instruction that I want to talk to you about is kind of dealing with our experts from a care and feeding perspective. When I work with expert witnesses, uh, I want advance notice that they're going to be part of the case. Uh, and when I'm getting ready to depose an expert witness or when I am working with my own expert witness, the report that has to be reduced, that has to be produced in the civil arena to comply with the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 26 is a wonderful thing because that report binds the expert witness in a way that the expert witness was not bound 
prior to the change to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 26. So many of the things that we used to do in depositions practice in the civil arena to define the parameters of the expert's opinion are not necessary uh, given that change. And in fact, if we do them now, we actually open the door to allowing them to modify their opinion. And, and I'll talk about that in another block of instruction, but it's something to keep in the back of your head as you think about it. And then I have a, a, a really difficult job as the lawyer presenting the expert witness or attacking the expert witness. They speak an expert, I've got to translate into common English. The testimony has to be normal, and uh, those of you who've dealt with experts know that, that making them normal is sometimes a challenge, if not downright impossible, because the very thing that makes them special makes them special, and it causes uh, communication issues that you've got to be aware of. Sometimes it's hard to get out of the way of your education and actually sound like a human being. Uh, or your particular area of expertise may have removed you from the normal flow of, uh, of human commerce, so to speak. And then, of course, um, as I think about experts, what picture, what diagram, what uh, demonstration can help the jury understand the validity of the expert witness's testimony? Uh, and, and demonstrative evidence is really important there. And we're always building teams uh, when we're working with the experts. The expert is part of the team. The expert is covered by attorney-client uh, privilege until such time as they're designated as a testifying expert. Once they testify, uh, once they're designated that they're going to take the stand, once they're designated for deposition, not only have I waived privileges to any conversation that I've had with that expert, but I've also waived privilege with what any other member of my team may have said to that expert as far as it applies to the basis of their opinion. And this is particularly um, troubling sometimes in criminal cases where part of the expert's work is uh, conversations with the accused that might otherwise uh, be covered by uh, you know, the Fifth Amendment right uh, to remain silent. It's one of those things that you have to think about. And then, of course, I'm always looking at learned treatises and the way in which I can use those from a cross-examination perspective, from attacking the validity. And then the last thing that I want to leave you with is don't forget the changes to the federal rules of civil procedure and how they impact the presentation of expert witnesses. And, and that's a fundamental thing that we have to think about now as we make de decisions about whether or not to depose an expert witness. Because if I'm going to depose the expert witness, I need to be thinking about um, the ramifications of Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 26 and Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 37. Now I'll talk about that uh, in the next uh, block of instruction. Uh, till then, uh, I'm Charlie Rose. Uh, great to see you digitally, and uh, maybe I'll meet you in person somewhere down the road.